All right, guys, we're going to do this maybe in one day or two, the end of the war in Europe. I'm talking to myself, pay no attention. War in Europe. So we last got through, like, the Battle of the Bulge, and now we're going to close on the Rhine River, the big border, the mile-wide border going into Germany, what we tried to cross in the failed Operation Market Garden. And so here's where things begin to get politically dicey and will set us up for part of the 20th century. From February 4th to 11th, the three big leaders, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin, are going to meet in at the famous Yalta Conference to figure out what they are going to do after the war is over with Germany. British manpower and equipment influence was waning. This is now going to be a war that's going to be won by the United States and the Soviet Union. So there are three things that each leader wants. Stalin wants to secure Russia and its borders, it's to make sure Russia is safe. Roosevelt wants to befriend Russia, kind of bring them into the Western European climate and establish his idea of the United Nations. And Churchill wants to defeat Germany and make sure the Soviets don't get too powerful. So each leader has their own objective going in here. So here are the three leaders sit around with the most famous photos in all of the 20th century. And this is what they come up with. The city of Berlin is going to be divided into at least three and then four later spheres of influence. The Soviets will take eight boroughs, the British will take six in the northwest, the United States will take six in the southwest. The French don't get any because they collaborated and um, they had really done nothing to help out. The French, however, wanted some boroughs. The Soviets would not budge and give any up so the British gave a couple of theirs to the Soviet Union. Also, the country of Poland was sacrificed and given over to the Soviets, since they were already there and they had occupied it. Churchill and the Poles saw this as treachery. Wait a minute, you turned your back on us. Roosevelt, however, had to give it up in order to get the Soviet Union to declare war on Japan. The atomic bomb was not created yet, and he needed another ally over there. Because of the length that the battles like we've been talking about, Saipan and Guam and Peleliu were taking so long, the retaking of the Philippines, projections were not to finish World War II in the Pacific to 1946 or 47. They were going to bring American troops that fought in Europe and then just transfer them to the Pacific since they were already in the army and trained. And people were getting war weary. But Roosevelt wants to save U.S. lives even at the expense of our British and Polish allies. The big winner in all this is Joseph Stalin. as He is able to place puppet governors in governments in those Eastern Bloc countries, he got all of his objectives plus access to the Black Sea, a warm water port that Russia's been after since Peter the Great that will affect the world up until 1990. So here comes the famous city of East Berlin, if you've seen your Bridge of Spies or any of the good old late James Bond movies. The American sector, the British, the smaller French, and the giant Soviet sector. While that is going on, the military troops are racing, racing excuse me, to the Rhine River. Um, after Market Garden, Montgomery is attacking with his Dragoon Guards, trying to close on the Rohr River, to the towns of Wiesel and Dortmund. In the center, in the middle, heading for Cologne, the big industrial sector, are um, Omar Bradley's subordinates, William Simpson and Courtney Hodges. Patton is going to be down there to the south, and Patton was given like a free reign down there. And Simpson says, 
that he and Patton were both older than Eisenhower and Bradley, yet the two old men still had to carry the ball for the two younger guys. And Patton is headed for the city of Bonn and the little town slash village of Ramagan. And as the Allied armies were closing on the Rhine, and all the major bridges, I mean, the, the Rhine is a big major river. Think of it as the Mississippi. All of the bridges had been destroyed, or so we thought. And then, in early March, an industrial and reconnaissance platoon scout, Emmett Burroughs, reaches the bluffs over this tiny little village of Remagen, and he looked down and saw the Ludendorff Railroad Bridge, named for old World War I General Ludendorff, and he's like, oh my God, is that bridge secure? So he calls his CO, Lieutenant Timmerman, who radios headquarters and says, guys, you're not going to believe it, but down here, I found an intact bridge. While we were beginning to, Pat was beginning to rush troops there, the Germans are arguing over what to do. Here is um, Burroughs, excuse me, overlooking the Remagen Bridge, crossing into the heartland of Germany. Timmerman says, get men and tanks across that bridge as fast as you can. On the German side was an engineering captain, Karl Friesenhahn. He, on his own accord, without asking permission, tries to blow up the bridge at 4 p.m. to stop the American tanks. At this time, there had been three German guys arguing, each one claiming that they were responsible for the bridge. We've got Major Hans Schuler, Captain Willy Bratag, and Friesenhahn. All claimed to be the one in authority to blow up the bridge. Schuller and Bretag wanted an order in writing, so if anything went wrong, they could not be blamed for. Friesenhahn saying, the heck with you guys, turns the key to blow up the explosives and nothing happens. The bridge is intact. All of a sudden, they find out that the radio deton detonator didn't work, so they had to rewire it to a plunger that had to, be, had to be operated by hand. By this time, Timmerman and his men are going hand over hand across the girders, throwing the explosives into the river. And United States Sergeant Alexander Drabeck will become the first foreign soldier to set foot across the Rhine River into the heartland of Germany since Napoleon in 1815. The Germans were beaten back, and Schuler grabs a bike and tries to pedal again, not a jeep, not a car, not a truck, a bike, to pedal his way back to headquarters to tell everyone the bridge was intact. Meanwhile, um, the other two officers are going to um, surrender. Here is Ramagan Bridge. You can see the tanks going across it, um, and off we go. Planking was put across the bridge. The engineers built a pontoon bridge 24 hours later, and men and equipment are pouring across into the heartland of Germany. Now Patton, being Patton, gets up and drank several cups of water and a pot of coffee and strode out onto the Rhine River Bridge, stopped halfway in a loud voice and says, this is what I think of the Rhine River in Germany, unzipped his fly, and took his um, morning um, pee into the um, Rhine River with men cheering, Woo! Here we go. So, um, over there, um, we're going to find the Messerschmitt 262. There were ten of them. Patton is going to give a young German pilot the explicit orders to fly them out of there so the Soviets do not get their hands um, on them. So that is what is going to um, take place. They will fly 10. He, the young man will fly from where he's at over into France, get a U.S. transport back, land, get into another ME-262, and fly it out of there. It's where we begin to understand the power of jet-powered aircraft. I'll tell you that story um, tomorrow. So on March 9th, Patton calls his boss Bradley and says, Hey! How are things going? What's going on up there? And Bradley says, well, I don't know. No one's over the Rhine yet, but Monty's getting awfully daggone close. 
Patton says, well, do you think we should tell them I crossed 36 hours ago? What? Yeah, I found a bridge. Do you think we should tell them? And, and Bradley, who was sick to death of Montgomery, says, boy, that's awesome. Hot dog. That's really going to bunch him up. The Germans try everything possible. They try bombing it. They send in 262s, artillery, V-2 rockets, even swimmers tried to put explosives and blow up the bridge. None of them could do it, and the bridge is intact. Schuler, the guy who read, um, rode the bike back to say the bridge was still intact, will get court-martialed and later shot for allowing the bridge to be captured. As a result of Germany being breached, legendary German Field Marshal Gerd von Rundstadt is fired for the second and final time. The head of the Luftwaffe, Albert, Albert Kesselring, the man who um, engineered the fight for Italy, excuse me, takes over. However, the United States are now aimed right at the industrial heartland of Germany for Dusseldorf, Cologne, Hamburg, cities like that. It's the old Buffalo, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, um, Detroit, Chicago of the old American Rust Belt. Patton was across the Rhine and with it, that meant Germany's days were just simply numbered. On March 28th, Montgomery's 21st Army, Bradley's 9th, Patton's 3rd and 7th Armies are now all over the river into Germany. Four million American soldiers are waiting to deal a fatal death blow to Germany. Now, Walter Model, the little creepy-looking, kind of joker-looking guy with that monocle um, I showed you guys, had pledged allegiance to Hitler, eternal allegiance. Unfortunately for him, he makes a bad guess at this time. Model moves the 15th Panzer Army to block the shortest route of Courtney Hodges to the Ruhr Valley. This puts Model in the north, trying to block um, Hodges Drive coming into the industrial sector from the north. Hodges will outwit him and speed south and come around all the way behind him. You know, you had to go guess north or south. Well, north is the most direct route, and Modal guesses um, poorly. Um, Patton, um, Simpson, and Bradley all link up together, and now Germany is encircled. So this is where the area that they were heading for. Um, Modal guesses that we were going to go up this way in turn. We swooped south, came around behind, and surrounded them like we wanted to do at the Falaise Gap. The major German cities, as you can see, Hamm, Dortmund, Essen, Cologne, are now completely surrounded. His generals wanted Hitler to give ground to have his men fall back and defend Berlin, and he says, no, we will not withdraw under pain of death. No one leaves. Model had pledged to turn allegiance. Now he has to stay and die with his men. Several generals were sent to help break through, but none of them could. The equipment, the men, were not once what the German war machine was. And in fact, General Gustav von Zagen, he and the 15th Panzer, they just turn and they flee. They run. So, um, we are now going to piece by piece dismantle the German army. In the small town of Paderborn was an SS training facility. In it were 60 Panther and Tiger tanks, and they are brought out and thrown into the line, and as powerful as they were, they only were able to slow Hodges down for a small time. With the awesome power of the Tiger, we had to find a way to defeat them because the Sherman um, just wasn't strong enough. So the new Hellcat tank destroyer was brought in, and it just blows the German equipment to pieces. The Germans are trapped now in a box 75 miles long, 35 miles wide, a kill box, surrounded on all sides. They had nowhere to go. 
upon seeing this, 37,000 German soldiers and their generals are going to surrender. They literally march down the middle of the Autobahn on foot, saying that they were shocked at how much equipment we had. They were told that their army was the most mobile on the planet, and they couldn't believe everything that we had come uh, coming at them. So here's a good old um, uh, Hellcat tank destroyer coming rolling at you. Here's Patter on board. This is what it looked like, the SS training facility, and now it's destroyed. I love this photograph. Guys just streaming, marching west in good order, and you got tank and jeep and two and a half ton truck and more and more and more and more and more, and the Germans said, Okay, that's it. Model, who had always been a staunch critic of Field Marshal von Paulus' decision to surrender in Stalingrad, and von Paulus later said, yes, but at least I brought guys home. Well, Model walks into the woods, and on April 18th, he shoots himself, keeping his eternal pledge to Hitler. And so now the gloves are really off, and Germany is going to be bombed. The P-51 Mustang is going to have external fuel tanks mounted on it. This allows it to escort the B-17 and B-24 bombers deep into Germany. The historic city of Cologne is bombed 22 times. The only thing that was off limits was the cathedral, which the pilots and bombardiers used as their landmark. And then there are different accounts of the bombing of the city of Dresden. Um, you know, American author Kurt Vonnegut writes about him, some of this, about um, how he felt. And on April 13th to 15th, um, Dresden is bombed, and contrary to popular opinion at the time, was that civilians were killed. There was no military targets there. And that is not true. There were 127 factories, a major railroad installation, so industrially it was a legitimate target. However, it was bombed with a new thing known as a firebomb. And Sir Arthur Harris of the Royal Air Force was blamed for this firebombing as it created a super vacuum, and a lot of the German civilians were in bomb shelters, but the air was so hot it sucked out all of the oxygen causing many civilian deaths. In reality, it was the United States Army Air Force that did commit this bombing. But Dresden was defended by nearly a million men and surrounded by thousands of anti-aircraft guns. Rommel, if you put this in perspective, only had half a million men to defend all of Normandy. There was twice that in one city. So it was a legitimate military target. Also, it is the only time that the ME-262, the twin jet-powered aircraft, flew briefly for 20 to 30 minutes, but it was able to shoot our P-51s out of the sky until they ran out of gas. The pilots and the P-51s said they could not believe what was happening. And the first American pilot to fly it said he felt that he was riding on angels' wings. Jet power was just simply awesome. Um, I'll tell you a story tomorrow about the, um, about the um, Norden bomb site. And here is, you know, one of our big B-24s just laying waste to a city. Um, strategic bombing was much different. And you can see all of this is just rubble. It kind of looks like Eindhoven after the Germans were done with it, except for the famous Cologne Cathedral and its Gothic flying buttresses. Here are some of the civilians and people that died in the superheated vacuum of Dresden, which was bombed um, relentlessly. Um, it is shortly after this um, that the first concentration camps are found. On April the 4th, it is Easy Company of the 506, 101st Airborne, that will find the first small concentration camp in the town of Ordorf. Um, when they called headquarters, they were asked to describe it, and they said, we can't, you just have to come and see it. Easy Company was operating in Patton's sector, so Patton shows up and he will call in Bradley and Eisenhower to witness it. 
Upon protesting and saying it wasn't true, Patton made the mayor, the burgomaster, and his wife walk through the camp. When they were done, they both went home and hanged themselves. Patton ordered the entire town out to help clean it up. And many people began crying and weeping, but the American soldiers were none too sympathetic. Shortly thereafter, that Buchenwald was discovered. One of the largest concentration camps was discovered and liberated. And Ilsa um, Cook, the commandant's wife, she is the psychopath that took the tattooed skin of some of the inmates and sewn them together to make lampshades. A completely, totally hideous um, woman. On April 12th, Nordhausen, Nordhausen excuse me, was then liberated where the inmates were found locked underground working in factories helping to supply munitions to the um, German army. They suffered from dehydration, from diarrhea, from dysentery, as they were not allowed to leave the assembly line to do their business. They had to do it and work at the same time. Um, it was also a V-2 rocket slave labor camp, so nobody there was um, left alive. 150 inmates there died per day. It was on April 15th that Bergen Belsen was liberated. Um, it's one of the worst sites of malnutrition and starvation. This is the famous camp um, there where Anne Frank had lived. And a lot of these, like Auschwitz, um, Bergen-Belsen were out in the middle of nowhere in eastern Germany or in Poland. Shortly after that, the concentration camp of Dachau was found right in western Germany, um, not too far from Munich. And seeing this stuff renewed the Allies' um, this gusto to end the war. Here is um, Patton and Bradley talking about um, Orndorff. They just really didn't know what to do. Here are some of the poor bodies and the people in the ovens um, in um, Dachau. Um, this is for me one of the only worthwhile things to see in um, the city of Amsterdam. This is Anne Frank's house. There's my beautiful wife. If you've read the diary, this is the tree um, that Anne Frank talks about looking through the window when she was trapped upstairs um, in the attic um, during the early part of her book. Um, anyway, on April 12th, um, Bradley's army is splitting Germany into different sections. Patton is going to turn due south and head towards Austria, while Hodges goes east to meet the Russians on the Elbe River. Other army groups began occupational duties, policing the prisoners, policing the towns and the people. Part of Omar Bradley's 2nd Armored Division were racing for the Elbe. When they ran out of gasoline or their vehicles broke down, they stole or liberated cars from Germans, dumped gas in them, and they called themselves the Ragtag Army. They carried spray paint and stencils. They spray painted a white American star on the car and raced ahead and they covered 73 miles in one day. They said it was incredible. Nobody was shooting at us um, anymore. Here's one of the vehicles that they are going to steal, and here's part of the party of the American soldiers linking up with their Russian allies. Here is the Elbe River. This young man um, right here is Captain Bud Parsons. He is here from Chapel Hill and lived just behind... Um, Phillips Middle School um, for um, many years. Um, problem is, when they got to the Elbe River, the bridge there was destroyed, so they couldn't cross, and Berlin was only 70 miles away. Um, the American Army took a brief pause because President Roosevelt died that day. So there was a day of, of mourning and silence for the president, and General Henry Stimson said, look, you give me gas, I'll be, I'll be in Berlin, 48, 72 hours max. However, as he flew to see Omar Bradley, he was told no. Eisenhower said, while Berlin is a great prize, it is going to cost too many lives. If the Russians want it, they can have it. 
We now know it took about 300,000 Soviet lives to capture um, Berlin. So William Robinson, his second lieutenant, approaches the Elbe with a tablecloth for surrender to make sure the Russians knew who he was. Then he and Edgar Bud Parsons links up, and they said it was one of the great parties the soldiers ever had on either side of the Elbe River. Hitler tells his SS and Hitler youth members to flee into the mountains and fight like werewolves, fight a guerrilla war. And so at this time, we've got a couple groups. We've got Maxwell Taylor's 101st Airborne Division, Alexander Patch's 7th Army, and French General Leclerc's 2nd Army all wanted to capture the town of Birch's Garden, Hitler's Eagle's Nest. That's where the Germans were preparing their last stand. It is Easy Company, once again, who will claim the prize. And they will cap capture Hitler's Eagle's Nest up here. And this is his private house built 700 feet above the town, his private retreat looking over this beautiful alpine valley. Here are the members of Easy Company as they sit on Hitler's deck, drinking uh, his um, wine and stealing souvenirs. And you can now see it's a pretty, it's a tourist attraction between May and October. You can get up there before it's snowed in. The town is very creepy. The only way to get to get up there was to be a hardcore Nazi. Um, so if you were up there, you were a Nazi. And it is here, if you ask me, I'll tell you the story about um, Richard Winters and the only thing he said he ever took from um, World War II. Um, Hitler is going to enter Berlin in um, April, and he has to move from the Reich Chancellery to the bombproof Fuhrer bunker. Um, his command center was 15 miles away, and his officers had to make that trip twice a day, four trips back and forth, one there and one back, um, under heavy fire every day. The Soviets were about 50 miles away and closing. Um, um, Stalin had ordered famous hero of the Soviet Union, Yorgi Zhukov, to capture Berlin. There were 200,000 Germans and 1,500 tanks defending the city. Zhukov will hurl men into combat exactly like he did at Stalingrad and just absorbs just punishing, unbelievable losses. Finally, he breaches the staunch German defenses at the Sea Low Heights and enters the city. A total raving mad, bombed, drugged out of his mind, Hitler orders fantasy troops into battle, and they were going to hurl the invader back. And he says, if any commander who stops his men back will be shot within five hours. Everyone's like, dude, you're off your rocker. There is nobody left. By April 22nd, Hitler orders his staff to leave. And the next day, Hermann Goering says, you are cut off. I should take over the war. You don't know what's going on anymore. People were thinking that Goering may try and surrender. Hitler says no. And by the 25th, the Soviets were surrounding the city, and the Germans were falling back, fighting house to house, street to street in an ever-shrinking um, perimeter. Here is where it's all going to dramatically end at the Fuhrer bunker. On April 29th, Hitler dictates his last political and personal testaments, and he names Navy, Navy Admiral Donitz as president, and Joseph Goebbels is going to act as his chancellor. 1.30 a.m., he marries longtime girlfriend Ava Braun, and with the Russians a quarter mile away, he shot himself. Eva Braun takes poison, and the entire Goebbels family, husband, wife, and the little kids commit suicide. A couple days later, Soviet Major Vladimir Nikolina will climb the Reich Chancellor. He will topple the Nazi flag and hoist the Russian flag. And between April 16th and May 2nd, 305,000 Russian soldiers died taking the city. 
making Eisenhower's estimates almost spot on, saying, I don't have 300,000 lives to spare. There's Major Nicolina, and you can look at Berlin. It is just absolute rubble. After Hitler's suicide, Donitz orders all armies to surrender to the Americans. Don't be captured by the Russians. Surrender to the Americans if possible. He wanted to try and conclude peace with Great Britain and the United States and then help us, in his words, defeat the Soviet Union. And he tries some shifty little shady things. He sent Admiral Hans von Freiburg to Montgomery's headquarters offering surrender terms. He didn't go to an American. He didn't go to Eisenhower. He went to Montgomery, who didn't have the authority to accept. Being properly chastised, Montgomery sends him back um, to Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel, and who says, look, I will surrender all my troops in Holland and in Denmark um, to you. And after leaving Montgomery, Freeburg finds out he's got no one that's going to accept the entire surrender but Eisenhower, and he meets Eisenhower in Reeds. So um, uh, this is Freeburg, and this is Keitel um, right here. And the United States said, no, 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 no. You misunderstand. This is unconditional surrender. You're not surrendering part of anything, and they're going to keep anything. We are not going to help you defeat the Soviets. And Eisenhower says, I know what you are trying to do by surrendering piecemeal and to different generals. If you keep stalling, I will prevent any German from entering our lines, military or civilian. I will turn them around and let the Russians deal with them. Knowing how bad that would be for his countrymen, Freeburg has no um, choice. And on May 7th at 2.41 a.m., Alfred Yodel stated effective, May 8th ends the war in Europe. It is VE Day. Um, Eisenhower asked for a day delay to give Yorgi Zukov time to get there. And at 10.43 p.m., May 8th, 1945, the war in Europe is over. Here's Yodel and Donuts and the guys signing the surrender document, and a very happy Dwight Eisenhower holding up the multiple pens for the surrender. Upon hearing rumors, crowds began to gather outside of the Prime Minister's um, house on 10 Downing Street, waiting for Churchill, who comes out to the crowd and exclaims, the war is over. A London newspaper, the Daily Mirror, had this reoccurring cartoon character named Lady Jane. And Lady Jane claimed that when the war was over in May 1, she would walk naked through Trafalgar Square. So her character was John screaming, running, you know, being covered by hands and hair, saying the war is over. Just a, a, a wave of euphoria and singing breaks out. People march to Buckingham Palace where King George comes out five times. The current queen came out and waved and bonfires and, and searchlights go up and every light in London is turned on after six years of darkness and being under blackout um, restrictions. Here is um, Trafalgar Square and everyone is getting ready to have a wonderful grand time. Um, here's Churchill, here's the king. Here is the current queen. Everybody is just excited. In Paris, something bigger happens. A newspaper prints the letters peace, six inches tall, as hundreds of Allied aircraft fly over the city. And the party in Paris took place that was even bigger than its liberation party, according to Ernest Hemingway. And Churchill says, this is great. We have achieved peace or victory in, over Germany, but we still have to fight in the Pacific. Once again, reminding everybody to keep their eye on the target. Here's a picture of a copy of the um, uh, French newspaper, The Day the War Ends. In the United States, uh, New York City explodes with a ticker tape parade. 
St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York was overflowing. And President Truman says, while we can celebrate today, i got to echo Prime Minister Churchill's thoughts, the war is only half over. And remember, Germany remained formidable to the end. So from North Africa to Arnhem to Bastogne, the lightly held German positions, when threatened, were defended with swift violence. When pressed, the Germans reacted harshly. But right now you have won. Enjoy this celebration, but we still have to fight in the Pacific. Here is the um, New York Times. And while we were gaining victory in the West, the bloody battle for Okinawa is going on in the Pacific, ending with this famous picture of the sailor and the nurse who just died last year, one of the lasting photos of the 20th century, the VE Day ticker tape parade kiss. And that is the end of the war. In Europe, great American conflicts, we will do the same with Japan tomorrow.